Good morning for everyone who's watching online. Glad you guys can join us. How many of you put a star on your Christmas tree? Got a few hands. How many of you put an angel on your Christmas tree? Oh, we see who the real spiritual people are. Or at least the ones trying to get off the naughty list. There are some pretty interesting tree toppers these days. I want to show you just a couple. This first one, King Kong. Sticking with the original story. The Grinch. Oh, die hard. We are creative enough to come up with that, but not the cure to the common cold. Come on, people. Growing up, our cat thought that she was the Christmas tree topper. Our poor Christmas tree got knocked over so many times because of that terrorist. Here's a picture. <laughs> Gotta love that. More Americans have an angel on top of their Christmas tree than a star, in case you were curious. Statistically, there are more angels on top of Christmas trees than there are stars. The original tree topper was the angel. There were no rivals, especially no diehard. It was a reminder of God's heavenly host appearing over Bethlehem during that first Christmas. That's the reason why people started putting angels on top of the tree. Luke chapter 2, verse 13 through 14. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host, everyone say heavenly host, <laughs> appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Now, there is only one other time I know of in the Bible where the heavenly host all appear, and it's to Micah. So this is a big deal. It's only the second time in the whole Bible the, the whole heavenly host appear. And so I think we should read this next part together. It's going to be on the screen. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. How many of you could use some peace? Yes. This time of year, churches all over have little children dress up as angels. They put on robes, put on wings and halos and look super cute. And congregations all go, aww. And parents hope that their angels behave themselves. Pastors, kids never do. You do realize that demons once were angels. Think about it. All of the Christmas songs, think about all the Christmas songs with angels in it, and I want you guys to fill in the blank, and I'll give you a hint. The answer is going to be angel. All right, you're welcome. All right, so first look on the screen, Hark the Herald. Angels. Sing. Next one. Blank, we have all heard on high. Angels. There you go. Oh, come and behold and born the king of? Angels. All right. Grandma got ran over by a? Reindeer, you're right, because angels don't go running over little old ladies. And they also don't help out baseball players in the outfield. The angels show up five times in the Christmas story. Three times in Matthew and two times in Luke. Joseph is visited by an angel. Mary is visited by an angel. And the shepherds are visited by a choir of angels. Now make a mental note of that, because we'll come back to it. But think about it. Joseph gets an angel, Mary gets an angel, and then the shepherds get a choir of angels. Think of the contrast there. Now I've had three kids, and an angel did not show up to tell my wife that she was pregnant for any of them. Not even the really cute one. But God uses his most important messengers to share his most important message. He uses his most important messengers to share his most important message. Luke 1, 26 through 28. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Everyone say Mary. Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Most Christians don't think about angels until Christmas time. That wasn't true in the medieval church. They were obsessed with angels. St. Thomas Aquinas wrestled with over a hundred questions about angels, including the following. How many angels can dance on the head of a pen? That was a legit question that they wrestled with. I'm so glad we graduated beyond that. The real question I find myself asking is, can an angel help me find my pen? 
or explain why there's never a pen in my office when I need one, because I've bought thousands of them. Thank you. (laughs) And yet they're all gone. One little girl asked her teacher, why do angels shoot people with an arrow to help them fall in love? That doesn't feel very loving. I think she had Cuban mixed up there. I think about angels just about as much as I dream of sugar plum fairies, which is never. I have never dreamt of a sugar plum fairy. They're not on my theological radar, but that wasn't true for the early church. They talked about angels all the time. Here's just a sample from Acts, Acts 5.19. During the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Can I get an amen? Amen. Acts 8.26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. Acts 10.3. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. Talking about Peter. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Oh, it was Cornelius, not Peter. My bad. Cornelius. It would be weird if it was Peter and he said, hey, Cornelius. That's not my name, angel. All right. And the list goes on longer than a thousand Hallmark cheesy Christmas movies. Let's talk about angels for a moment. Do angels have halos? (laughs) You guys are hesitant. You're like, I don't want to answer wrong. No, the answer is no. Do angels all play harps? No. No. You're more enthusiastic about that one. Do angels sit on your shoulder like in the cartoons? No. Do angels get wings every time a bell rings? No. Good job. It was disappointing for some of you. In spite of the Renaissance artist who depicted a lot of the paintings that we, that we get our ideas of angels from, we don't know exactly what they look like on a daily basis biblically. This is probably why George Bailey's guardian angel in It's Wonderful Life, does anyone know what his name is? Clarence, do you know his last name? Oddbody. Clarence Oddbody. There's a hint there. If you've ever been told you look like an angel, you probably took that as a compliment. Oh, I look like an angel. Wait until you find out what they look like according to Ezekiel. In the book of Ezekiel, the prophet's vision depicts them as having four faces. I would say four faces. That of a lion? That's not bad. An ox? Not such a compliment then. An eagle and then a human. And then with four wings rather than two. This is not a hot profile date. We need to keep in mind this is apocalyptic language. Everyone say apocalyptic. That's going to be the word for this Christmas. Man, that gift was apocalyptic. That eggnog was apocalyptic. Apocalyptic means that the prophet is speaking poetically about something he can't wrap his mind around. He's speaking poetically about something he can't wrap his mind around. An angel doesn't literally have four faces. It's poetic. For example, angels in the Old Testament are sometimes called seraphim. Seraphim derives from the Hebrew word seraph, which means to burn. My wife is a seraph because she's on fire. She's hot. David describes angels as flames of fire in Psalm 104, verse 4. Flames of fire. Because they are spirits. They only appear physically on rare occasions. The word angel means messenger. Everyone say messenger. Did you know that the same word used for angel is also used for preachers in the Bible? Which means, biblically speaking, I'm a little angel. I mean, let's keep it biblically accurate. I don't have a halo. The Bible has more than 300 separate references to angels. 300 separate references to angels. It's an angel that blocks Adam and Eve from being able to enter the Garden of Eden after they have fallen. But then it's an angel that shows up after Christ's resurrection to announce that the way back to God has been opened back up. It's awesome. When there's an emergency, what number are you supposed to call? 911. The Bible tells us in Psalm 91, verse 11, Psalm 91, verse 11, the Lord will give his angels charge of you to protect you in all your ways. The Lord will give his angels charge of you to protect you in all your ways. 
that's easy to remember because like 911, this is Psalm 91:11 or 9111. John Owen notes that God provided himself with two distinct families, humanity and angels. Humanity and angels. We only know the names of two angels. Does anyone know what they are? Gabriel and Michael. Yes, from the Protestant Bible, only two. But in the Catholic Bible, there's a third. Do you know what his name is? Raphael. And unlike the Ninja Turtle, he doesn't have size. Though that would be cool. Raphael. When a group of kids were asked to name the angels from the Bible, one girl said Harold. When the teacher asked where she got the name Harold, she responded, Hark the Herald Angel Sings, duh. <laughs> the clearest statement about angels comes from Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14. It says, not, Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? While we might not know a lot about the angels, we know that they are in this room right now that they have been sent to help us unwrap all that Christmas has to offer and all that Christmas means. Sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. More than half of Americans, according to a recent survey, believe that they are protected by a guardian angel. Half of Americans believe they are protected by a guardian angel. The other half are Packers fans. (laughs) And all the Bears fans said? Amen. 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 I have a feeling that my guardian angel looks a lot like this. It's the same pose my wife does all the time. Now, while we often picture angels as soft and cuddly, like a Valentine's chubby baby, listen to the following verse. Now, because there are kids in the room, I'm going to replace one of the words with hug. So you'll kind of know what I'm talking about, but we'll keep it PG. All right. 2 Kings 19.35. That night, the angel of the Lord went around and hugged 85,000 in the Assyrian camp. When the people got up the next morning, there were all the hugged people. (laughs) A single angel hugs 185,000 people. What a hug. (laughs) Now, can you picture this angel doing that, the way we picture it? Can you picture that? You'd be the one going around hugging 185,000 Assyrians. I think we might have the wrong picture of an angel. In the Bible, every person who encounters an angel is completely frightened by the appearance. Some even faint, so that they fall before the angel. Now, it could be because of how they look or the fact that they have a habit of appearing out of thin air. They're the best at jump scares. One of the most common names for God in the prophetic books is Lord of Angel Armies. Lord of angel armies. I imagine real angels are somewhere between Doctor Who's weeping angel and Michael Landon. Somewhere in between those spectrums. Now, let's look at the shepherd's reaction and bring it back to the Christmas story. Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 9. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. They're not just scared, they're terrified. And in the King James, it says they were sore afraid. I love that. They were sore afraid. My first encounter with angels was my grandma's precious moments angel collection. We knew if you broke them, grandma broke you. I think her favorite verse was, spare the rod, spoil the child. I see some of you had the same grandma. She was built like Drago from Rocky IV. And she had no problem spanking you in Jesus' name. I will spank you in Jesus' name. And you wonder why I am the way I am. These shepherds who are used to defending their sheep against robbers and wild animals are terrified. Luke 2.10, but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Have you ever noticed how many mistakes there are in Christmas movies? Kevin sits down to a delicious plate of mac and cheese in Home Alone. You guys remember that scene? He sits down to some mac and cheese. If you watch a little later on, they show the same scene, him sitting there, and now it's a TV dinner rather than mac and cheese. They completely mess up. 
In a Christmas movie, the teacher opens her desk drawer, which is full of pranks, including chattering teeth. The movie is set in 1939. Do you know when chattering teeth were invented? 1949. Proving time travel is real. In It's a Wonderful Life, Clarence tells George that his brother died at the age of nine. But the tombstone reads 1911 to 1919. 19 minus 11 is eight. eight. Math isn't for everybody. While Clarence the angel fails at basic subtraction, it's the angel's role to make sure there are no mistakes in the original Christmas story. It's the angel's role to make sure there's no mistakes in the original Christmas story. Angels at the first Christmas showed that God was sovereign. He was in charge of the first Christmas, just as he's in charge of every Christmas, including this one. We all have things that are going on in our life that don't feel very Christmassy, but we need to take comfort knowing that God is still on the throne, that he is in charge we think that the primary role of a guardian angel is to protect us when the primary role is for them to prepare us. We think it's to protect us, but it's to prepare us. To prepare us to live out all that Christmas means. To be holy as God is holy. One of the roles of the angels was to move the shepherds from terror to great joy. From the field to the manger. And their role is to lead us back to the manger as well as Tessa said, to remind us of what Christmas is really all about. I don't know about you, but this Christmas, I want to experience great joy. I want to experience what the angels promised. I want to experience what the shepherds experienced as they ran into Bethlehem that first time. I want to experience what Mary experienced as she held baby Jesus for the first time. I want to experience what the angels experienced as they shouted out glory to God in the highest. And how do we do that? When we have to spend time with in-laws that act like outlaws. When the Christmas lawn ornaments keep blowing over. When our Amazon order won't arrive until after Christmas. When it's predicted that we will have no snow this Christmas. It's going to be a green Christmas. When our attitude feels like tinsel in the vacuum. Was there clapping? Wow. Wow. Bah humbug. All right. We have to believe what the angels said. The angels tell us more about the true meaning of Christmas than anyone else in the biblical narrative. Even though we tend to hydroplane past the angels, they tell us the most about what Christmas truly means. Luke 2, 8 through 9. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. When a person gives birth, who do they typically tell first? I heard one. A father. Parents. Family. All right. All the answers over here. This side. What do you got? Dad. Doctor. Whoever reads social media first. I knew a girl, true story, who was on the phone with her company while she was giving birth. They were on the phone, and they knew about what was going on. Before the days of Facebook, you would typically tell friends and family, and maybe a few random people along the way. When one of my sons was born, I was beside myself. I spent nine months thinking that he was going to be a girl. We didn't do an ultrasound. We didn't want any scientific. We just knew in our guts it was going to be a girl. So when he came out with boy parts, I jumped out, and I said, It's a boy! Someone had bought me one of those dorky dad t-shirts. I didn't have to wear it for people to know I had a kid. I was going up and down the hall telling everyone who would listen to me. But you better believe the first people I told was the family who was out in the waiting room for 24 hours. Suzanne was so slow about the whole thing. <laughs> it's like, babe, there are people waiting. Can we speed this up? I mean, come on. We're being selfish here. But who does God choose to tell first? Shepherds. Think about that. He tells shepherds. How many of you ladies want a bunch of strange dudes to be the first ones to meet your baby? <laughs> Mary doesn't know them. I don't know you. You probably didn't even wash your hands. 
While Matthew focuses on the wise men and their gifts, Luke focuses on the shepherds and their lack of gifts. There's a reason why shepherds were never invited to baby showers. A scene that has been on millions of Christmas cards, reenacted during thousands of Christmas plays, read during countless Christmas services never should have happened. Think about it. People Magazine, several years ago, spent $4 million for the rights to publish a picture of Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt's daughter Shiloh. I'm sure she's pretty, I'm sure she's great, but she's not Jesus. This is the first announcement that the Son of God has been born. God could have sent the angels to anyone. He could have sent the birth announcement to the rich, the famous, the religious, even Mary's family back in Nazareth. Hey, guys, guess what? She was telling the truth. But a group of unnamed shepherds, why does God do that? Bethlehem is a mere 5.5 miles from the Jewish capital, Jerusalem. Why didn't the angels appear to the Roman governor or King Herod? Why don't the angels appear to the Jewish high priest at the temple? Do you know what the most celebrated job in Israel is at that time? The rabbi. They were the celebrity of the day. Before the days of Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey, kids were into Hillel and Baruch. (laughs) But the angels didn't appear to them. The most powerful person of the day was Caesar. His face was on the money that Joseph carried when he had any. But the angels don't appear to him. Shepherds were poor. They were ceremonially unclean. They were never invited to parties. If a shepherd was under a mistletoe, no one was going to kiss them. No one said, when I grow up, I want to be a shepherd. No one said that. No one was like, hey, I want to be a shepherd when I grow up. Sure, David was a shepherd, but he was remembered as David the king, not David the shepherd. It was a rags to riches story. When kids played, they played David as Goli- against Goliath, not David and the sheep. They were just a few steps from the homeless. And yet God chooses to bless them with the good news that Jesus has been born. The people who have, heart, who have a hard time with Christmas are the ones who need it the most. Not commercial Christmas. Not candy cane, Christmas lane, and Christmas blend latte stain. They need Jesus. Now, this news didn't change the shepherds' circumstances. They didn't suddenly stop being shepherds and become filthy rich. They didn't go on a tour packing out churches for people who wanted to hear their story. They didn't sell a book on five steps on hearing from God. In fact, we never hear from them again. This is their only appearance in the Bible. And yet, it is significant because their perspective was changed. Their hope was sparked Their great joy came from realizing that they could be forgiven. That they could have peace with God. Even though the religious community rejected them, that didn't mean that God had rejected them. Maybe they couldn't win in a biblical trivia contest. Maybe they didn't go to synagogue as often as they should. And maybe they forgot to pray before eating their meal. Yet God loved them so much that he allowed them to experience something millions of really religious people only dreamt about. And missed out on. They had peace because they realized we can have a relationship with God. We can look forward to a day when all things will be made right. And listen to the angels. Luke 2.14. Glory to God in the highest heaven. And on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. When my family, a few years ago, went out to go buy a real Christmas tree... So we oftentimes do an artificial, but we went out to go buy a real Christmas tree. And my kids took off running, and they wanted to go get the biggest one on the lot, the most expensive one. It was around that time that we found out that my wife was losing her eyesight. She has retinitis pigmentosa. And while we all ran ahead, she was standing in the center row immobilized because she couldn't see anything. Where is the peace in that? Where is the favor Doesn't favor mean that God gives me the front row parking spot? Doesn't favor mean that Starbucks takes two minutes too long and gives me a free drink? Doesn't favor mean my kids sleep in on Christmas morning? Doesn't favor mean the bills are always magically paid and I'm immune to calories? Doesn't favor mean no one ever gives me a fruitcake? Doesn't favor mean my wants and God's will are always the same? Let me put it this in the best Christmas way I know. 
No, 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 no. So what do the angels mean when they say that we're going to have the favor of the Lord because of Christmas? Notice they actually don't say peace on earth. A lot of people hear that. They hear, they're like, oh, he came to bring peace on earth. Cool. They don't say that. They say, on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. They don't say peace to the whole earth. They say peace on those whom his favor rests. The point is not that Jesus came to bring peace on earth. He came to bring peace between us and God. And that's a huge difference. He came to bring peace between us and God. My prayer is that all of us would see Christmas through the eyes of the angels who are worshiping their guts out. Who are with us as we open presents and want to remind us of the greatest present. And to move us from terror to great joy. When you came in, you should have received a bell. Everyone hold that up. You should have got a bell on your way in. Some of them were small, some of them were bigger. Go ahead and hold that up. I didn't say jingle them. I just said hold them up. You guys are so rebellious. Just kidding. In the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, we are told that every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings. While that's not theologically true, at Christmas time, I want the bells to remind you of something. Because bells are a big thing at Christmas. Think about how many Christmas songs have bells in them. Jingle bells, silver bells, taco bells. <laughs> when you hear a bell this holiday season, let it be a reminder of two groups. One, angels. Everyone say angels. angels. Angels are trying to lead you towards joy and peace this Christmas. They've been sent to minister to those who have salvation, right? We read that. They've been sent to minister to those who have salvation. They're leading us. All right. But the second group I want you to think about is shepherds. Everyone say shepherds. While you may feel rejected like one of the shepherds, maybe you feel like you're on the fringe of faith, and that's where they were. They were out in the fields. They were away from everyone else. They felt like they are on the fringe of faith. No one invited them to synagogue. No one invited them to the parties. Christmas is a reminder that God went out of his way for you. Christmas is for you. Something that's interesting is the Mishnah, which is a group of documents that were used by the rabbi that would instruct them on how to interpret the scriptures and how to interpret the law. There was actually a principle in the Mishnah from the first century that talks about the role of sheep and where they could be and not be in Israel. And I want to read this small section because I think it says something about these shepherds. It says, It is expressly forbidden to keep flocks throughout the land of Israel except for in the wilderness. So you can't have sheep anywhere but the wilderness. And the only flocks otherwise kept would be those for the temple services. So the only sheep that you can have is either out in the desert, and the ones that are in Israel have to be used for the temple services. These shepherds were in the fields surrounding Bethlehem, not the desert. So it's possible, probable, most likely, that they were in charge of the sheep used for temple sacrifice. So when they are invited to come meet Jesus, they were shown the final lamb that would be slain, and they were about to be out of a job. That they would no longer have to keep the sheep that would be used for temple sacrifice, that would be used for the forgiveness of sins over and over and over again because the final sacrifice was about to be made, and they would be out of a job puts an added significance to why God invited the shepherds to be there to meet Jesus for the first time. Luke 2.14, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When you see a bell, you hear a bell, I want you to think of those two people, the angels and the shepherds, this holiday season. Amen? Amen. I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up, and I'm going to say a prayer for all of us. Father, thank you for Christmas. That Christmas isn't about all the things that it has become, but that Christmas is about you being willing to enter into our pain, enter into our suffering, and to die so that we might have life and forgiveness and hope and wholeness. And God, I pray for those who are here this morning who don't yet know that peace, don't yet know that joy, that this Christmas, they would encounter the first Christmas. That they would encounter your love, your presence, your desire, 
And God, like the shepherds, that we would be invited into that nativity where we can see the final sacrifice so that we might walk with confidence, we might walk with hope, we might walk with healing. We thank you in your name. Amen.